one. And welcome everybody to another Smart Money Circle update. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is James Hill, who's the CEO of MCF Energy. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for taking the time and coming on the show today. Yes, good morning. Thank you for taking the time to interview me. So, Jim, I always like to ask, can you tell us a little about your story and how you got to where you are today, please? Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, as you can tell by my gray hair, I've been in the industry for a little while. I uh, actually started with the U.S. Geological Survey back in 1971 and um, went through various major and minor oil companies during their career until I finally ended up forming my own my own company in 1986, which primarily was focused on consulting to uh, uh, companies, also uh, acquiring assets, producing assets. At that particular point in time, the price of energy was very low and it was real hard to to stay alive. And, and of course, that was a good time to buy, uh, you know, buy low, sell high. And, uh, you know, we went through a number of tough years with some of the producing properties that we had, but we survived. And that actually uh, ended up being vended into a uh, company on the Canadian Venture Exchange uh, in kind of a reverse merger. Um, and that was a way of, uh, of you know, raising capital and, and, and getting into the public space. Uh, that worked out very well. Um, and we got taken over in a hostile takeover, and I didn't realize at the point uh, that banks have a deposit limit, not just a withdrawal limit, but a deposit limit. I had to go to the bank twice. Oh, so that was a terrible day. That was that was a terrible day. In any case, moving moving on, though, um, how I became involved with the, the people that were are currently sponsoring MCF Energy is that uh, there was a company called Bankers Petroleum that had been put together. And at that time, they had an asset in Albania. And Albania is a country that was incredibly locked up because of the, uh, the government at the time, political situations. And very few people realized that the largest, one of the largest onshore oil fields in Europe was in Albania. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And we had the concession. Um, it worked out, <laughs> again, that worked out very, very well. We took the production from 600 barrels a day up to about 19,000 before it was finally purchased out by the by the Chinese. Um, from that point on, um, we had actually made several discoveries. Uh, one of them was in Oklahoma, which uh, we uh, butterflied off onto what was called BNK Petroleum. And, you know, our focus was to develop those assets that we found in Oklahoma. And at the same time, uh, we started to explore in Europe because at that point our focus was on shale gas. I mean, all companies at that time were playing shale gas. Um, you know, it was it was basically a zero risk proposition for investment groups. Well, shale gas, uh, you know, at one time, you know, the planet was all stuck together. So, you know, shale is shale. And, you know, hey, Europe's got shale. Wahoo. So we went into Europe at that point, uh, that was about 12 years ago, and we had uh, very large concession holdings in Poland, Germany, and Spain. Um, we couldn't really do much in Germany and Spain at that point because of the political environment uh, and you know data requirements, uh, but we did get six wells drilled in Poland and actually found shale gas in Poland. But because of some political changes and some economic changes, uh, we couldn't develop it. it Took an additional billion dollars besides the hundred million I threw at it uh, to develop a shale play, and because of the changes in the Polish governmental rules, uh, we couldn't get a partner, so we had to had to drop that. At that point, um, I decided that uh, you know the the focus of the company should be a lot more in uh, what we had, which of course was in Oklahoma. So I actually retired from BNK because I was, you know, not involved in international exploration with BNK anymore and went into retirement. Um, I, it wasn't real retirement. Like so many guys like me, you never really retire. Right. Uh, the idea was, as I consulted to a number of companies in Europe, kind of kept my hand into what was going on in the, in the European scene. So that when the black swan event happened, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, the same uh, group of um, investors and uh, money money venture people, the bankers, petroleum, and BNK both, uh, gave me a ring and said, "Hey, look, um, you know this is a unique opportunity. Um, 
Europe is going to be starving <laughs> for gas. Uh, there is going to be a real problem here that, you know, LNG will help help solve, but it won't, won't completely cure the problem. So at that point, I came out of retirement and started to draw on the, the uh, experience and the, more importantly, the people that I knew within Europe. Having worked in Europe for so many years, I knew all the companies that were there. I knew the great people. I also knew the bad people. Right. And uh, so, you know, we put together a team of uh, technical people that I thought was was really, really unique and skilled. And also here in the United States, one of my major advisors uh, was a geologist who actually went into machine learning and AI in the remote sensing space. Wow. She actually helped the, the software company develop the software package to review the remote sensing data and extract those things that we can't see with our eye. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that, you know, we as geologists and geophysicists have done, we see it, you know, you, you, you shoot the remote sensing data, you see where to drill. Well, there's a lot more information in the data set right. and a machine learning pulls that out. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and uh, Deborah Deborah Zachary has had an eighty percent success rate drilling in areas that I never would have drilled with my eye. Wow! So you know this is this is really a breakthrough technology, and and don't get me wrong, more and more companies are utilizing it, but this is one of the risk um, mitigating factors that we apply in going after our targets, mm -hmm. because yeah. when we reviewed twenty different projects in Europe, uh, we selected two. And of those two, we were looking specifically at a risk reward type of scenario. I'm willing to accept more risk if the reward is there. Right. And of course, utilizing the technologies and the experience of our people, uh, we can significantly reduce the risk over some of the other people. So this is this is basically how MCF came into, into being. It's about a year old now. Uh, we have uh, six concessions in Europe at this point. Uh, we uh, purchased a uh, private German company called Genexco, uh, not only for the prospects that they had, which were many, uh, but also for the operating team. Because in doing that, we had an operating entity in Europe that was known by the ministry. And more importantly, they spoke German. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, and were known by the ministry. So, you know, we, 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 we kind of leaped ahead very rapidly at that point. Uh, so yeah, it, it's it's been a it's been a good run. Uh, the other prospect is in Austria. Uh, that one is a risk to reward play. Um, this thing is so big you can see it from space. Wow! Uh, the actual the actual structure covers a hundred square kilometers, and there was a well drilled not very far away that produced gas and condensate at what today would be very economic rates. So I'm very excited about that one as well. So. So yeah, that's kind of a kind of us in a nutshell at the moment. I love that. So that's a great story about how you got involved. Now with MC Energy specifically, can you give us a overview about some of your competitive advantages, what exactly you do, and speak to that a little bit, please? Well, the real competitive advantage we had is we were kind of first mover in the space. Okay. I mean, we were we were there, you know, right after the invasion. I mean, the fact that I knew all the companies. And I had consulted for a number of those companies, you know, during the years previous to the invasion, I knew kind of sort of who was playing in the space. Mm -hmm. uh, they were very willing to talk to us. They uh, gave us, you know, access to their portfolios and data. And, you know, I brought together the management team who had been operating in Europe for over 30 years. Gotcha. Uh, you know, these, you know, uh, Rich, Richie uh, uh, has drilled wells all over Europe and uh has has been actively operating in in you know all over including ukraine uh which by the way has has great possibilities i'm pretty sure the invasion was related to the fact that there's a lot of energy resources in ukraine oh wow that's a really good point <laughs> yeah. so yeah that's a really powerful point okay let's speak about you mentioned risk and reward i'm a very big believer in risk and my next question actually is how do you handle risk and what are some mistakes you see people make with respect to risk management? Well, risk is something that, that um, you know, is always present, especially in the exploration space. 
And in, in balancing risk to reward, of course, you can't just let the reward override the real risk of what you're looking at here. So you have to do a very detailed analysis on why do you think there's oil and gas here? For instance, on the Austrian asset, you know, they, it's a huge structure, okay? It could, it, it could contain, you know, <laughs> huge volumes of gas and, and, and condensate. But on the other hand, how do I know there's gas there? Well, you know, there was a well drilled nearby that produced gas. So that told me I had gas in the system. Right. It also told me I had a reservoir that would, could produce gas at economic rates. I had a seal, which is very important. You know, if you don't have a cap on the bottle, you're not going to have anything in the bottle. God, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so, so everything that I needed to accumulate oil and gas, including the gas, was there. <laughs> so the fact that this thing was so big and had a limited data set associated with it because there were no wells drilled on it. Uh, you know, that said, okay, the risk is huge. I've got everything I need. And not only that, but the dry hole cost on this thing is 3.8 million euros. Wait, well, sorry, you said the risk is huge or you meant the reward is huge? No, the reward is huge. The, the, the risk, huge. yeah, yeah, but in, in balancing the risk. And the, the thing that was critical was that to test the play was less than 4 million euros for a potential half to one TCF of reserves. Wow. So, you know, when you're looking at something that large, you know, I'm willing to roll the dice on it. And also, you know, you've got to, you've got to balance your participation. You don't want to blow your brains out by taking hundred percent right. of it right. and wiping out your treasury. Right. So right. You know, we, we only, we only took 20% of the deal uh, for paying half of the well cost, which was only, which was less than 4 million euros. So this was a great shot. And then to balance that in the portfolio, we went into the German company, Genexco. They had a proven gas field mm -hmm. with, you know, 180 BCF of potential reserves there. I think it's 180 BCF. And it had three wells that proved that the gas was there. So, you know, bringing that to market, of course, was the next problem, which we looked at in great detail and looked at the economics. Um, in, in that in that analysis and in looking at the prospects after we bought Genexco, we realized that there was tremendous, tremendous opportunities in some of the other areas that Genexco had identified. And they couldn't prosecute because they were a small independent company. They didn't have the money. Got well, it. we brought it. So we've got uh, LEC, which is a, a major, uh, major play for us right now. Mobile drilled a well in 1983, which oh, wow. they were looking at oh. oil. They found gas. What a terrible thing. And uh, this well, uh, you know, flowed at, at a, an extremely economic rate. Mm -hmm. And of course, yeah. they, they abandoned it. They drilled another well. They found oil. It was less than their economics. They abandoned it. As soon as that concession became available, Genexco jumped on it. And that's part of our portfolio. Uh, yeah. We also yeah. acquired... 100 square kilometers directly offsetting it, which this trend goes right up into that. So we've got tremendous opportunities looking at us in the future. If I understand your answer properly, when you look at risk and reward is that you want to see asymmetric returns. So small risk if you're wrong, big reward if you're right. And the way that you make those decisions is by looking at the almost the TAM, the total addressable market. How big is this market for you if it hits? And what is the possible R in the ROI? And then you're able to say, okay, if it costs me one unit or $1 and I can possibly make a thousand, then sure, I'll take that trade, so to speak. If it's $1 and I can make 50 cents and clearly I'm not going to do it or one to one, you won't even do it. Is there a certain formula or minimum threshold that you look at with respect to one unit of risk versus how much reward, like 5X, 10X, 100X that you take? Or is it just subjective and depending on the multiple variables at play? The basic rule that I follow is it has to be impactful to our investors. Got it. In other words, for the outlay that we put out, it has to be impactful to the share price and to the actual viability of the company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's if it's too small, it's it's not worth our time and energy. You know, yeah, I've yeah. got I've got some of the best staff in the world. I don't want them wasting their time on on itty bitty things. Put it that way. You Understood. know, it's got to it's got to be impactful.
Yeah, that's fantastic. So, Jim, you've got a really great career and you've been around now for decades doing this and success, extremely successful at it. I love the deposit maximum, by the way. I hope one day that I can get there. Um, what are some timeless lessons? You know, what are some timeless lessons you've learned along the way that you'd like to share with the audience? In life, business, markets, investing, anywhere you want to go. The, probably the the biggest one that I developed because I've gone through several periods of good times and bad times mm -hmm. in this industry <laughs> is that you have to maintain that positive attitude. You cannot fall victim to, Oh, woe is me. Yeah. Because yeah. really good times and bad times are really only a matter of attitude. 100%. I mean, during during the bad times, we were able to pick up 1,700 acres on the north plunge of an oil field that later on proved up 186 million barrels. Wow. I mean, I mean, at the time, got it, it wasn't worth much. Right. And of course, nobody saw the potential. But, you know, as the company, as prices got better and the company recovered, this is when the hostile takeover came. You know, right. other people right. saw it and they said, well, thank you for playing. You know, here's money. Yeah, you know, like I said, it wasn't a bad day, but this is extremely important. Yeah. And not only that, but but failure is not an option. Right. My previous partner kept this company together. Uh, you know, it, despite the fact we should have gone bankrupt half a dozen times. You know, he worked it out. You know, he worked with the creditors. He worked with the service providers. You know, every month we'd get the run check, and we would call them. Wow. We call the creditors and say, well, okay, here's how much I owe you. Here's how much I can pay you. And here's what I'm doing to get you paid. Mm -hmm. Failure is not an option. And if you've got that attitude, you will succeed. I love that. That is so powerful. It's almost like rain to take what you're saying about uh, perspective. Rain is neither good or bad. If you're in a drought and the farmers want to grow crops and, and then all of a sudden it rains, they're really, it's, it's a good thing. If you're trying to go on vacation and sun pan and it rains for the whole week and you have to stay indoors, it's a bad thing. But it's it's just a matter of mindset. It's your opinion if it's good or bad. And even if it's raining outside and you want it to not rain, it still can be a good thing for you. It all depends on your perspective and you control that. That is so powerful. And that failure yeah, no, is not an option. I love that. No, too. Fail, failure, failure is not an option. I love that. And that and, and that that is that is the lesson that I learned uh during 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 that period of time when bad times were actually the best of times. Mm -hmm. And you look back you know in hindsight. I mean. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You learn, yeah, for sure. So okay, yeah. next question. Timeless mistakes you've made and or you've seen other people make, and how do you avoid them? The biggest mistakes I've seen, especially when I was working with major oil companies, was the fact that they did not engage the communities or the stakeholders when they moved into an area. And this really generated, you know, it not just rancor against the company because they're coming in and they're cutting pads and they're running roads and that sort of thing. But it 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 really built an era of distrust, you right. know, and, and anger. Mm -hmm. Um in the in the past couple of projects that we've done in Europe, uh, we have gone way out of our way to engage the communities, to engage the stakeholders, mm -hmm. and to be as transparent as possible with with these people. In Poland, we held community meetings, uh, not just with the mayor or you know the fire chief or whoever. We had actual community gatherings where people could express their questions. Because there's a basic underlying fear um, that, you know, has been generated. Um, and you've got to address that fear. You've got to prove to these people that, you know, hey, we are going to be your neighbor. Right. Uh, we are a member of your community and we are going to be around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And we want to be a positive member of your community. And like you, we want to drink clean water and breathe clean air. Just you do, okay? Right. Now, if we're going to be next door, uh, we're going to be living the same life that you are. And if you can do that, you know, if you can, if you can have that transparency. For instance, one of the things we did was go around and sample every water well that surrounded our drill site. Oh wow! Before, Great. Before we and we made that public information before we drilled. After we drilled and completed. We did exactly the same thing, same wells if we could get at them, 
and again, made that information public to say, hey, look, we are transparent. If you got a question, that here it is. You know, we have preserved your environment. And yeah. if you can and be a positive member of the community, the community will be behind you. Yeah, that's so powerful. That is so powerful. So instead of hiding, so to speak, get in front of it. It's like what you did with the creditors. It's like, hey, here's our situation. Yeah. I love Absolutely. That. Love get that. in front of you and you face your problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk about leadership, Jim. What are some what makes a great leader and what are some lessons you've learned about leadership? Well, a, a great leader is is somebody that that has the foresight to anticipate uh, future problems, but also the tenacity to work through those problems. Right. Uh, you know, you've got to have somebody who's who's willing to step up and and face the bull with only that little red cloth that you've got in front of you. Right. Right. Uh, and, you know, to not give up after the first or second pass. I mean, yes. it's it's. Yeah, there you go. There's the bull right there, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, you know, you know, that is, that is a person that you can rely on, uh, mm -hmm. to, to guide, to guide the ship, but more importantly, you've got to have a staff behind you and I right. do that will say, Hey, you know, maybe we should do it this way. Mm -hmm. You know, my way may not be the right way. And I'm perfectly aware of that. And I'm very, very willing to listen to people right. who have been there before. Right. Um, you know, but again, ultimately as the leader, the decision relies, you know, with, with you and in your hands, because, you know, I, I'm not big on taking votes, but I sure do listen to everybody. Yeah. That's really powerful. Now let's talk about adversity and obstacles. How do you handle adversity and what are some obstacles you've had to overcome? Well, you know, the, the main obstacles are, are you know, in, at least in Europe have been the ministries and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, it was extremely difficult to get anything done. It would take you years to get a permit oh, wow. uh, to do to do anything. Um, the company that we're partnered with in Austria just got a well drilled and completed in six months. Oh, wow. You know, the attitude uh, of Europe finally has changed. Um, the EU has declared natural gas green. Excellent. Renewable. Okay and a transition fuel to the transition to a carbon-free world, which it is. I mean, there is no way you can lay out enough solar panels or enough, you know, wind farms to meet the energy demand and make sure that the grid, which is another real problem that people don't realize, is that you have to have the grid to carry that power, you know, into the cities. And of course, when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, you know, you've got to have a have a have a backup power and, and natural gas is perfect for that. Plus the fact that natural gas is very much a, a uh, an industrial fuel and a, a base for petrochemicals. Mm -hmm. So you're always going to have a need need for that. So that's one of the things that, that you can't really control, but is turning more in our direction. And of course, the others is just public perception. And, and I think I already addressed that by saying we we try and engage the communities. Excellent. Then uh, let's talk about adversity, though. How do you handle it? Let's say something bad happens. I, I noticed you mentioned earlier the optimism. I love that. And having the tenacity to work through your problems, getting in front of your problems. These are all timeless lessons you've shared. What happens when things go wrong or quote unquote bad in addition to changing your mindset? How do you handle that adversity? And what advice would you give to have other people that might be struggling or going through tough times? Well, again, the idea is to not let it overwhelm you. <laughs> which is which which in some cases it certainly tries yes uh, and staff you know i mean let's face it a black swan event is something that that occurs very rarely and it's totally unpredictable right. but the idea yeah. is is that you know in 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 working through the problem there are always solutions right it's like when we didn't have enough money to pay the creditors what do you do you call the creditors exactly you work through the problem you know you right. find the solution and, you know, if, if you've got a good team and tenacity, you will work through that problem. Yeah, that's so powerful. Beautiful. Okay, uh, Jim, final question for you. What is the best piece of advice you'd like to share with the audience or give your 30-year-old self? Well, again, you know, never, never fall victim to negative thoughts. Uh, you know, there's always a silver lining to the cloud. 
and you never you never let the clouds get in the way of the silver lining you know when there's when there's a, you know an event that happens you say okay you know what's the positive of this because there's always a positive right. somebody somebody's right. always on the right side of the equation yeah and number 2 as an investor you have to look very closely at the management team Right. You know, and and right. not not just the 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 board of directors and and whatnot, which by the way, I've got an exceptional board of directors, but also the technical team behind them. Who are they? What's their experience level? What's their success level? And also, when you're investing in microcap companies, mm -hmm. never never invest more in your portfolio than you are prepared to lose. Right. This right. is something mm -hmm. I've always told people. You know, yes, this is going to be a great project, but you never want to put in more money than you're prepared to lose. Right. Yes, you could get a 100 return on this. And again, one good one pays for a lot of bad ones. Right. But on the other yeah. hand, you've got to be invested in enough in enough projects to get that one or two good ones. Yeah. 100%. So the idea is, again, it's like what we do is you blend your risk. You blend your risk to the reward. Love it. Well, Jim, thank you so much for coming on the show. People can learn more by going to mcfenergy.com. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. We've got our Beautiful. corporate presentation there and uh, our investor relations team is there to answer any questions that anybody might have. We love it. Well, thank you, Jim. And hopefully we'll have you on again soon. This is fantastic. Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed it. Take care now.